Hi, this is Yulia Yani with Relatan, and this is our new podcast series with uh, uh, innovators in commercial real estate lending industry. Um, just before I start, Real Atom is an industry leading uh, lending as a SaaS technology that powers commercial real estate lenders like banks, credit unions, and non bank organizations to make more loans. And today I'm welcoming, I'm so happy uh, to have our new guest, uh, our founder and president of Eastern Union, a leading national commercial mortgage brokerage firm uh, headquartered in New York with offices across the country. Uh, Ira Zlotovich. Ira, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. We spoke about, uh, for so many years, different technology, different ideas, and finally we're happy to do a, a technology podcast Zoom together. <laughs> well, you know, with all the pandemic things, now that's how we communicate, right? Yeah, listen, we started, we started in a Starbucks near my Maryland office. That was our first meeting. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the interesting thing, uh, you were like the first, uh, one of the very first people who reacted when we launched our uh, platform, because I think you and I think the same uh, direction, and I'm very happy to, you know, bring your thoughts to the general public today. So why don't we start with you telling us about yourself and what you do? So... <clears throat> Like you said before, we're a commercial mortgage broker. Um, we're probably the most technologically advanced and innovative in the industry. Um, you know, COVID obviously brought, I say, brought 2030 to 2020. It sped up the technology of the world 10 years and allowed us as well also to pivot and adjust um, to, to the technology. But we're first and foremost a trusted advisor. We're humans first, a, 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 a Commercial real estate owner will always need a human involved. Technology will empower the humans to do more. So instead of a broker in my office being able to close, you know, 50 transactions with technology, they can close 100 transactions. But the human is never going to be replaced. And I think that different platforms that think the human is going to be replaced, that's where the downfalls are. For the same token, people say technology will never replace the broker. So therefore, <clears throat> don't invest in technology. They're also going to be out. It's going to be the hybrid. And we believe that we built the best hybrid, half human, half machine. We have people in the office that know nothing about technology, but they only know the human side of relationships and understanding. That people who are machine learning AI experts that are building out the technology, and a lot of people in the middle and in between. So we're first and foremost a trusted advisor. As a broker, we stay very true to our course and and our core, and we utilize technology at every step to, to the flow of information and the processes to make sure that when a broker gets on the phone with a client and they talk to a client about which bank to go to, we're using the latest and greatest in technology and data to pinpoint the right lender for that situation. Uh, that, that's a very uh, good introduction of what you do, but you've been running your company for some time. Can you tell us how you started? So it's actually, to, you know, <clears throat> May 17th is actually going to be the 20th anniversary. Oh my so God, congratulations. We did it within, within a couple of days of my anniversary. We're a uh, business anniversary of doing this. Um, I started in the business, I'm in the business for 24 years. I'm fortunate enough to be able to be doing the same thing for 24 years. Be a trusted advisor to the largest real estate owners and banks to be able to broker commercial loans. Um, so as a firm, um, we started um, 20 years ago. We, 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 we built up and started just with a, you know, like everyone else, a small office. And I always believed in building that trusted relationship and advisory. And where I took it a little bit of a different approach is that I always looked and saw the business to, to become a business where clients were really selling data. If you break it down, a broker is selling data. I know which bank is hot, which bank is not hot, which bank will do this particular deal. How does a bank want to see the numbers? How does a bank underwrite the deal? How do you underwrite your deal? And based on that, making all those matching points of, of, of what we built and what we did. So I started off as a small company. I wanted to keep those core values in place. And we spent these last 20 years keep building and adapting at any single time to the changes that the market is going through. The market will keep going through. And as a, as a commercial mortgage broker, trusted advisor to these clients, we had to adjust to what was needed throughout, throughout each, each, uh, each time. So where we 
built a uniqueness now firm to a lot of other firms as well is on the human side as well. We're, we're the only mortgage brokerage firm to my knowledge that has a credit department. When a deal comes in, it's a credit department, reviews it and decides if we should even take on that assignment. And, and even if we do take on an assignment, make sure that the information, information have checks and balances. The information is, is valid through the process. Now, we're not a bank and we, this is self-imposed. So it's not like banks using us because of it. These are things we put self-imposed in our front end. We have a special department just as underwriting and setups. So we have departments that could assist the broker staff. We have a department that's banking. We have a department now, literally this past week, we, we brought another five people to the banking department. We brought the, the number to over 10 between, between people to focus on the technology side of it, people to focus on actual bank relationships, analyzing deals to really make sure that, that when a broker brings in a deal on behalf of a client, they're getting the best that humans could build that relationship and know what banks and index every single bank in the country to know, hey, which is the right bank to get it done. So as, as a commercial mortgage broker in the space that we're in, we're going to keep adapting to what's needed at that time and try to always take the approach that we're young enough to change, experienced enough to get your deal done and execute. We have to go ahead and, and, and execute from there. So interesting. What I just heard that you guys are very hands-on when it comes to the deal, uh, uh, you know, underwriting execution, uh, uh, sourcing the lenders. Where does the technology come within, you know, that picture? So the technology in that picture allows, you know, let's say it would normally take to process a loan, um, human hours, 20 human hours, just using a, a time spread out over a few months. We use technology to be able to streamline that process instead of 20 hours, then 19 hours, 18 hours, 17 hours, and 16 hours. That's one side of it. The other side of the technology we use is more on the data side of it. How can we collect and know data about every part of the country and then the broker focus the broker where to go so for example we built this this technology internally which we call ask qts so the banking department is called qts which is the acronym for quotes and term sheets the technology is ask qts where a broker could literally type in an address into the system and the system will tell the broker which banks are potential lenders and sort it in the in the probable order of who will be the best for that deal and and give you all the background information on that bank. When normally, what would happen now, a broker brings in a deal, has his own gut of which banks to go to, plus we'll call up other brokers and try to get different ideas. Over here, we have the system. The system is taking, we're using technology to gather information from three sources. One, public records. Which banks close in that area, that property type? That will make it to the list. Number two, every time we send that deal out to a bank, we get a quote, we, get a, we make an offer, and we submit it to a bank, it also tracks in that area which banks that other brokers in the company actually send deals to and actually get quotes from and actually tie up deals. And number three is we have the human side. In a conversation with a bank, a bank will tell us, I like multifamily in Texas. So I have a great story. I'm sitting there by lunch with a banker and a banker in the middle of lunch says, by the way, I don't know if I could tell you guys that we are, we, we really can do construction in a certain area. Right there and then I went into the, into this, into the system I changed that lending criteria that they'll do construction in that area. And all of a sudden, um, I tell him I'm going to change it now live. And all of a sudden, things start about three minutes later, his, his, his phone, he gets an email. It looks like he goes, you move fast. Someone in your office just sent me a deal that matched that criteria. So that's, we're using that technology in that area. So the broker, my office is a regular broker. He sent out a deal the day before to six banks, trying to shop it. And all of a sudden, the next day, did nothing differently. The system notified him, remember the deal you brought in? You might also want to send it to. Are you interested? Mm -hmm. Click here and the system could go. So the fact we use technology to everyone uses one system in the company. We met unique also from like the largest firms. Most firms, the brokers have their own little, you know, their own book of how they keep their, their business. Everyone yeah. uses one, one, one platform, one system. The culture is a sharing culture of sharing of data. So this information is, is, is searchable at any given moment. You know, as soon as you said that shareable data, you know, we talk to so many brokerages in the country and everyone, like all those small teams, they're so protective of their data. But I think, you know, what you guys are doing is really uh, helping your clients to benefit from that, right? Because, you know, it's not, you know, me and my analyst, so it's 
me and my analyst, 20 more brokers and the whole company can dig into that database, right? But, but yes, but the reality is that although it, it's true, it helps a client, but if a broker is not going to feel secure, then then they can't really help a client either. So it's fine and dandy to put information to a company system, but they have to trust that the company is not going to go and 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 take their data and use it for someone else's information that could hurt them. So like I know by us, the culture in the office is everyone knows working here. When I hire them, it's listen here, I'm going to be an innovator. I'm always going to go where the market's going. So if you're the personality, like to do things the old way and stay with it, we're not going to be a good match for you. We're going to always want to go ahead and innovate. If we see the market heading in a certain direction, we're going to leave there. My, some of the biggest mistakes that we made, did we go to certain areas maybe a little too soon? And we, we, I could have had a few more years of a different way. Did I invest heavy in the technology? I started building this technology you know, five, six years ago. I should have really started something only two, three years ago because the market, the first two years, the, the counterparty wasn't using technology enough. So how could I send them a deal on a platform? They weren't familiar. You know, today we talk about New York City announced and, and that there's no more Zoom. They're never going to have a snow day anymore. <clears throat> there's ever a day off from school, everyone's going to go on Zoom. The minute the pandemic started, I realized using Zoom, the world changed. No bank's ever going to have a credit committee. Oh, he's on vacation, he can't join. You're going to be yeah. told, this is the schedule. If you make a vacation, tell your significant other that during these two hours, you have to have access to Zoom and get on to. So I think the world changed in that respect. So everyone realized they want to be out of the office. And that's going to last. So we're using technology to really shave off time in the process, bring you data, and spend the money to do machine learning and AI that I should be able to. My goal is literally that I told them we just hired a major developer that has like, you know, like an Amazon, you know, work at an Amazon type of a level. And I said, my goal is um, that I'm going to go switch now to Apple. You're able to go to Hey Siri, and it should be able to turn around and ask the question, hey, ask. What, what rate can I get on a uh, multifamily in Brooklyn? And it'll give me that answer. That's my goal is to build a technology that simple. When I have that that simple, my brokers never miss a beat. So people ask me, what did actually make a difference in my business? When did I see the return on investment? Six months ago, for every 100 opportunities we got into the office, 16 moved forward. Now we're holding at 27%. Clearly, in our opinion, it's a lot of moving parts, the market and everything. But as we beefed up our banking relationships and figured out how to give that information, flow of information back to each broker, so they have intel in their fingertips, that was a big contributor. You never get to 100%. Clients don't buy the building. Clients, you're competing against another broker. Their existing bank comes in last minute. So usually you always want to be in the, you know, the best of brokers, typically average one out of three. Like in baseball, you're 333 average, you're great. We were at 16% with the new brokers and everything going on. The technology and the banking made this difference. A new broker comes in, they're just as experienced and knowledgeable as a top broker when it comes to which bank to go to for their transaction. That, that's a great insight. But let me ask you a tricky question. Everyone tell, says that technology helps them to save time. What do you guys do with that free time? Bring in more do deals. Play golf or make more deals? Yeah. I look at the other way around is that there's a certain amount of hours that I'm allocating. Most, the two types of people. Some people come to work every day because they want to make a certain amount of money. I'll tell you an amazing, great story about that line. So this person has a warehouse and has a big company. And the boss comes down to the warehouse. And one of the workers in the warehouse, when he has a question, he says, what's in that box? The guy climbs up and tells him it. And he goes over to the manager. He goes, you know something? Give this guy a raise. Okay. Gives him a raise and a bonus. And that comes back a month later, and the manager pulls the boss aside. I just want to let you know, since you gave him the raise, the guy starts slacking off. So the boss goes over to him and says, I don't understand what happened. You're such a great work. I gave you more money. He goes, oh, you don't understand. I need 300, whatever the number, I'm using a amount. I need $312 a week, whatever the math was. You gave me a raise, I could work less. <laughs> Most people the opposite. They want to grow. So to a certain extent, that's why I really tell people, what's my end goal? What do I want to do? with the success that I could have. So personally, I'd rather be able to give back, train people, hire people, We're running a mentorship program now in the summer. I'd rather give back. So if, if I could figure out how to automate this more and streamline it when the company grows, I love the fact that this, this past week, we were able to hire a bunch of people. I love the fact that we, we I created a real estate um, boot camp where I'm giving it out at this point for free and we're actually hiring people and people are telling us they're getting jobs in real estate. That's the basic training. I'm allowing anyone that wants to learn real estate to join for the first three weeks as if they're working in my company intern and do a real estate course simultaneous at the same time. 
So what am I doing? I decide I'm giving a certain amount of hours towards this business and the best it could go. If I can make it more efficient, I'll do more in that time. You know, I was going to ask you this question at the end, uh, but since you're talking about training people in the, uh, you know, boot camp, uh, camp uh, what would be one advice that you will give new brokers to succeed in our industry? So I, I think to, to it's not it's not so much to, you know, <clears throat> when I give it when I bring brokers on board, I say if you want to be successful. You have to have two pieces of the puzzle. And obviously, you have to be honest and you have to have a good work ethic and all those pieces of the puzzle. Go with the obvious that everyone's going to tell you. There's two pieces of the puzzle that you must have to start off your career. And if you don't have this, you know, you have to have long term vision. All those things are great. There's two things. Number one, you have to take ownership for yourself. We're living in a society today. When you mess up, you can blame someone else. There's no messing anybody else. You take ownership. You have an issue, open your mouth. You're not being successful. You know what's coming. Don't blame anyone else. Bottom line is, in spite of, like, you know, Elon Musk got on to Saturday Night Live last week. And this is an amazing point everyone should know. He got up there and said he's, he has Asperger's. So he admitted to the world that I have Asperger's and he owned to his weakness. In spite of, look what he built. And that's to tell someone, don't change your weakness. Come to the table and own up. This is you. And people have different benefits. They start at different times. Own up to who you are, who you're not. Take responsibility. Don't blame anyone else. Because the bottom line is, if you come into my office, the reality is, people say leads are garbage. First of all, leads are always garbage. But one thing is for sure. With the, the reason why the goals are set at the level they are is based on the quality of the leads. If the leads are better, you have to do more. It's not like, if you gave me better leads, I can hit the goals. No. So this is the goal because they're garbage leads, if you want to call them garbage. I'll own up to the same way. I hire people, 25% of the leads are garbage. But I, someone walks into the office, I say, bottom line is, 10 people walk through the door here and figured out with these leads, in spite of all the negatives you're saying, how to become successful. Why not you? So number one is you have to take an ownership attitude. Own up who you are. Don't try to fool yourself, number one. Number two, that you can't avoid cold calling. If you're not going to start off your career for three to six months or three weeks, start a month, two months, every day, no matter what, make 150 calls. Every day, no matter what. As a telemarketer, don't say, I go to LinkedIn. I could get LinkedIn's icing on the cake. The cake is the calls. Get in, ingrained Pick a time. You don't want to do it for three months, two months. It's not one month, but the first month, no matter what, 150 a day. Then you have your foundation. It's going to go down from there. Utilize tech. Now, all these other ideas are great, but I found no one has ever become, no one has ever become a top producer without the foundation of making calls. You realize now all the salespeople are going to hate you because no one will have excuse now not to make those 150 calls. <laughs> No, they know I'm going to get different. Someone's going to show me. You see, I, I made the exception. So I tell people, you, are you the lottery ticket? You know, I mean, you didn't, you know, so if you're lottery ticket, fine. But if, as it is, the making calls is tough, you know, but uh, listen, that's the advice. I train more people as, thank God, I had the merit to train more people that started in commercial real estate than any other firm, period. And I look at people that have now, you know, nine figure net worths working in some of them became my competitors. And this is the end of the day, take the pride. At the end of the day, they started their career here. I train them to the best training in the industry. I take pride in it and try to hopefully also instill the right value system in them that as they make money, go and give it back. God gave you to be successful, give it back in your local community. Do something to give back and, and pay it back to, you know, pay it forward, be the go-giver. Yeah. That, that's a great, you know, way to go through life and through uh, business. Uh, and I'm sure you have a lot of grateful people, you know, thanking you for uh, what you did for them. So l let me ask you a different thing. Every time I'm reading news about you, I'm reading that you're launching, you know, new venture. So it seems like you always have these ideas and you're not just sitting on them, you're implementing them. Can you, can you talk uh, about those uh, different lines of business and why? Why? I mean, why okay. not just? Then, you know, so the good. Same so great. It's, every it, day. it's a great question. Um, it's easier for me to answer this question to you today because I have a year of a track record on the different points going back. So prior to a year ago, um, a year ago was a big turning point. I changed the pricing, how much we charge to do a mortgage. Instead of charging to refinance a multifamily deal, charging a point, I bring you to agency, I charge a quarter of a point and no back end. So we changed the pricing. Prior to that point, I realized seven years ago that my market is changing. Data, technology, and social media met unlimited data plans. 
and how everyone rich and poor for the first time in human civilization are connected. The rich travel differently, vacation differently, live differently, but it comes to the internet, we're all the same. And for $50 a month or less, go to Starbucks for free. Everyone has the same internet. So my phone might be cheaper, I tell us all the time, but my internet's the same as your internet. So what changed? Look around you. But aside from what changes around you is that when's the last time you saw a residential mortgage broker, a stock broker, a travel agent? Every industry is, is changing because of it. To find that right model, the right hybrid model. And I made a decision on levy Netflix out of my business. I'm going to be Uberized. I'm not going to have some tech startup come in and say, Ira, you're out of business. I'm going to be that tech startup. So what you really saw in the papers and the storylines is that I didn't know where the change was going to be. So up until leading up until a year ago, I invested in different areas of my business. Invest more in banking, invest more in underwriting, invest more in technology in this area, technology in that area, have this initiative, that initiative. And the turning point came on May of last year, 19th anniversary, we formed the multifamily group, led by the top two brokers in the company, Mark Trout, Michael Muller, and that became the recruiting machine. I had 30 brokers working for me. At that point, brokers left in protest. I said, I, I had a debate with them. They said, Ira, we agree with you that we're making a lot of money for the work we do, but we have two more years to milk the market. Well, let us enjoy it. I said, what are you doing two years in a day? We're all young. What are you doing that, that next morning? And I made the change. One third of the brokers left in protest. With 30 brokers, we, I repivoted the whole company based on using all the technology and initiatives I did prior to. I didn't know which one was going to work. I took the best of them. We we're holding in 80 brokers. I'm on pace to have 200 brokers by the year. So now we have a very singular business plan. I have 200 brokers. My history has been to be able to train people to close 100 deals a year, spend the next five years getting the 200 to close 100 each. I'm very singular focused now. 200 brokers closing 100 deals each. Every move you're ever going to read in the papers now will answer how I'm getting to those pieces of the puzzle. It's not new initiatives. It's things other people did. Prior to a year ago, it's like, it's why are you in that business for? What are you doing here? Why are you under... But in the last year, it's been very focused. So when I'm rolling out now, with, I think the most in, innovative thing that we're rolling out now is that when I started in my career, I, I was the one who introduced the commercial real estate telemarketing. The concept of telemarketing for commercial real estate was unheard of. Telemarketing sells widgets on your phone at, at night when you're middle of supper. You're not selling mortgages for big property. We're, I'm rolling out something called commissioned data brokers. There's a whole slew of people, bright, personable, but they have a day job. They can't afford the risk. And they don't want to make cold calls, but they'd love to break into commercial real estate. I'm launching a new line called commercial, com, commercial commissioned data brokers. Basically, I'm going to give them 200 properties that we think at a high probability are ripe to get refinanced, but we don't have the owner information. And I'll give them the tools they can work at night on their weekends where they could find the owner information. Then they could give it to one of the brokers in my office making calls. They get a 5% commission. If they go and they actually reach out to the person on LinkedIn and set up the call, instead of getting fired, they get 10%. If they stay date the person, again, now cold calling. You know the business you get just from text communication in today's dating? They'll go out there and they get 15%. So I could have people who could break into commercial real estate without being this fully polished person and calling, just some data. Just feel how to utilize data. So is that a new, it's just a creative way how to get to my 200 brokers and to do more deal flow. But everything we're doing is so that deal flow. Every move we're making. So when I invest in my banking department, could that increase my conversion rate? It will help them. It won't take them five years to close 100 deals. Hopefully they get to 100 deals in three years from now. So every move now. So up until a year ago, no one knew the end of the movie. So you're just watching me do a puzzle without seeing the puzzle on the, on the wall. Over here now, the puzzle's on the wall. 200 brokers closing 100 deals each is 20,000 commercial loans, which is one, about a 30% market share. That's my goal. I'm not focused on the fee per transaction, ultimately. I want to get to that goal. So my whole staff that's working with me now for the first time is on the same page. They all know the goal, and they all know how they fit in to that goal to get us where we want to get to. So you're not going to see the same innovative things, more creative things to move the company forward. That's, that's where we're at at this point. So we are distributing this podcast to like 90,000 people in the industry and you just gave away all your you know strategy and secrets for the next few years uh how do you feel about the competition i mean what do you think you're doing you know better than they do or maybe so, just different right so i think that you know my job is to do what i could do and as an orthodox jew believing in god 
you know, God will decide the ultimate result. Um, I think that what I realized is that it's not a secret. Everyone's trying to grow. What's the difference between the top few firms? They will go out there every day and try to hire more brokers and train more brokers, but they couldn't perfect certain aspects of the business. I perfected a recruiting system. I perfected a, a, a training program that I could train brokers and pick. We just It was written up this week from my training program. Some of them stayed on as a broker afterward, working at 10 months, closed a $32 million deal. So every company takes a different aspect of what they want. I, the biggest thing that I'm doing differently, I don't believe that my competition is the old school broker chips. I believe you're my competition. I believe other tech firms are my competition. I believe that if a CoStar or a Reanimate decide to change their business model, that one degree, they're selling data. If they went out and hired different types of staff, they could also marginalize. Maybe they can't, they're not going to replace. The, the data and technology are not replace the human, but they can marginalize the pricing. They can empower. So if I have someone in my, I have a broker who is an amazing broker, but he doesn't know how to have good relationships. He doesn't know how to, but if he utilized certain technologies, now he becomes supercharged. So that's my, the world's changing. But again, everyone is trying to grow. I have a single focus. I want 200 brokers times 100 and grow it out there. But again, my competitive advantage is everyone in my company, that was about 125 in the total staff approximately. They all use the exact same CRM from start to finish. And the culture is that they all realize they all make more money by sharing of data. That's my competitive advantage. Every other firm has to change a culture first to get everyone to trust the company, trust each other, share information, and realize sharing makes it better. That's where that's my competitive advantage to my clients. When a situation comes up, we're all on the same page. If I go into the investment sales business soon, which is the plan, setting something new, every firm has it. We have an innovative way how we're going there. We can, our target is we're going to target residential brokers that are either realize their industry is getting marginalized by technology or want to go to the next level. They want to start selling commercial. What's holding them back? They need a platform and they need education. My two strongest plays. That's the next play. So there's something innovative and new? No, every firm did it. They're just doing it a little bit differently. That's the direction you want to go to. And you keep treating people right and pay them the right commissions to go. So let me ask you, I mean, there is an opinion in the industry. You know, we are a very huge industry by dollar sign, but, you know, we're not such a big industry by the number of deals and... You know, if I'm doing, uh, uh, if I'm closing 10 large deals, you know, per year, or if I'm closing even, you know, 100 smaller deals per year, uh, do I really want to talk about efficiency? You know, I've been doing it through emails and whatever, Excel all my life, and I've been making money. Um, so maybe efficiency, that's not, you know, for our industry. Maybe it's, you know, for residential or others. What, how, how do you feel about it? So, you know, like I say, you know, they say that marketing is like religion. For those who believe there are no questions, for those who have questions, there are no answers. Same thing for these topics. People believe or don't believe. But what I'm finding, which is pretty scary, is that people tried for a long time to get brokers to become more efficient. Listen, the fact of the matter is, you know, with God's help, in the last, we opened up 20 years ago, we're the only company in the top 10 that started in the last 20 years. Only company got up there. And even along the way, when I had certain senior brokers could have left, in March of this year, I'm writing more loans than I wrote March of last year when my staff was in tech. So at the end of the day, people could say whatever they want, but the fact of the matter is, you know, this is working for me. And if you look at every company, they are trying to get more efficient. Every single company is trying to get more efficient. Why? Because they're noticing metrics that things do work a little bit better. But what I am noticing that's the direction you're going with the banks. That's the direction other companies are going with to target direct owners. Is that's really the competition is. The competition is really is if an owner had more tools, what percent of the deals would they have to even use a broker for? So there's 100% of the deals. If an owner had the tools, okay, there's a company showed me that they're a blend of LinkedIn and banking Intel merged into one, social media, and they'll, they'll email out the deals. They're targeting owners. If they're targeting owners, it's not that the owner is going direct. The owner has someone on the team running financing who now, they, some owners now could use those tools and don't have to use a broker 100% of the time, only 80% of the time. So the brokerage community shrinks there. I also think it's really just the pricing. It's the metrics of how people pay a broker. You pay for value. So if I deliver you a complicated deal, yes, I'm worth any dollar amount. Okay. But if I bring you an apartment building that anyone could have gotten for you, it should be more based on value. 
So that's what's going on. This is a quarter point versus a half a point versus a point. So you see what other companies are doing. The reality is they all know it. The question is, are willing to take a risk, take that loss? The decision, the tough part by me, look at Blockbuster. How did Blockbuster go out of business? How did, how did, how did, how did Hollywood Videos go out of business? Why didn't they make the move? It's very tough for a company to make a move. And also, many of the big firms are built around those big fees. When they lower their fees, that's their whole profit margin, the big part. Also, they have all, all the teams are, are set up sharing in the profit margin. And my company, planning one day to be here, is why I made less money during those planning years, is <clears throat> because I was paying salaries to these other departments. So I was paying the full commissions. I was paying the best commissions in the industry, plus having huge back office staff. So now, as the market changes, this back office staff is able to help conversion rates. But if I go to 200 brokers and I'm getting deal flow from you know, cross-channel selling, and then I could have salary staff work it. It blends out the, 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 the blended commission rate starts making sense. But I only had senior brokers and those staff. There was no profit margin. So it's, it's very tough for a huge shop to really make that turn in a brokerage space. And again, especially now, why does someone stay at a big shop? Honestly speaking, the big, without naming names, why does anyone stay at a big shop? In today's day and age, I'm a great broker. I'm working a shop, not as an IRA. Someone says, I'm a great broker. What does my company offer me? I'm leaving half the commission on the table for what? Because which bank to go? I know that already. Oh, they have a great CRM? Oh, I can hire this company has one for 500 a month I could use. Oh, banking intel? I could get it from this software provider. The threat is not, it's like Uber. The threat is Uber driver, car service drivers didn't go out of business. Car service companies went out of business. So I think there's going to be a day of reckoning over the next few years for brokerage firms. At the end of the day, the broker just need to place the, uh, a, a mortgage broker, a commercial um, sales broker, needs to just hang their shingle somewhere. So who do they want to hang it with? But why are they leaving so much on the table? That's the part that's changing. So that's why I think it's be fragmented to a much smaller even business. That's what it's going to. You, you, you know, uh, I was always wondering, uh, you say uh, you guys used to close 16% of your leads. Uh, now you, you know, up to- Not close, no, no, no. Closing is in the 90s. This is from, from bringing a deal to getting a, a term sheet accepted. Yes, right. What is happening to the rest of those, you know, uh, 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 leads? Like, where do they go? Do so they go a, to- by the way, it's a great question. So I know I, the answer is the answer really is there's, there's about a five, at this point, we, I always felt that this 30% is really ours. So if, it, if it's 16, I was leaving 14% potentially on the table. At 27%, I'm down to 3%. Okay. But don't forget, I call up a client who's already using my competitor. I say, give me a shot. He continues down the path, but I can't tie it up. So a person is buying a building. He doesn't end up buying the building. A person, we go down the line, about to tie it up, and he calls up his bank. By the way, I decided to go in a different direction. Bank, oh, you're leaving me? I'll match your rate. Oh, the guy changed my life to refinance. So it's not that we couldn't place the deals. You know, I, I, well, I track a different metric. I think it's like 99%, something like that. It's like in that, within 1%, we got the client the best the market had to offer. But it wasn't good enough to pay the fee. Difference. It, or it wasn't good enough for him to switch his relationship. It wasn't good enough to take a risk for the client of a new type of bank. So getting what the client wants, this technology got me into the 90s there. Actually, you have to match the client. But again, we, you know, you're talking about, you know, that, that they, they legalize marijuana, and you have all these dispensaries need, need debt. Well, I realize a new thing, by the way, because of the intel we have, we now found a lender that's willing to lend. Because of that, we're bringing more deal flow because of it. So now we know something you didn't know before. So we're bringing more deal flow because of the banking intel. It's not just helping me convert. We started realizing. My partner pointed this out. We're seeing new deal flow because of the banking intel we have. But again, the banking intel department can either work if people don't share. When my banking department calls up a top broker and says, what did you send a deal to? That broker answers. That broker shares information and realizes it's going to be in their best interest. That's a culture. Try to go into other companies. I speak to other brokers. Really, they share that information. I would never share that information. That's my trade secret. Because every broker we always knew, they'll clog that bank with deals. Everyone has a reason why they want to stay special at those banks that are doing business with. It's a different culture. So we, our culture is this culture. Do we have disadvantages to our culture? Without a doubt. There's no internal fighting in the firm. Zero. No one's fighting over commissions and conflicts, zero. You walk into the office, you meet the top 10 brokers, you will not be able to tell which one's number one, which one's number 10, which one's number 40. You're not going to be able to tell it. That's the culture that you want to build in a, in a company. So we lose out because of it, because of certain killer instincts and fights. If someone says, it's my client, we have a system back off. Other firms, eat what you're killing, you fight to the death. We don't have that culture. So I lose deals? 
I'd rather wake up every morning, be proud that this is the company I have and be proud when I meet people who started here where they went off to. Is it painful sometimes when someone leaves and they go, of course, there's a painful part of it. But when you look back and say, what's the goal in life? You look back. So I can enjoy every minute what I'm doing and feel good that the mission that I think God put me on this planet for, I could live on and you know make a better for that part of it. So to me, I'm living a life in that respect. I enjoy it, I think, for this world and believing there's an afterworld. I believe I'm uh, hopefully getting the brownie points for that world as well, you know? I, I, I always enjoy talking to you. You're so positive. Uh, let me ask you. So you guys, you know, uh, up to te- in technology, you know, uh, and, um, but you, you exist in an ecosystem, right? You have clients, you work with banks. So even if you implementing technology within your firm, what do you see happening with, you know, your, uh, um counterparties yeah counterparties what is happening to banks uh you know are your clients uh uh, using anything that helps you so so up until i would say before covid i think the only technological advances changed from the clients to us is that instead of a client over the phone telling you his rent roll or faxing your papers they send you excel (laughs) or pdfs so that that process went you know moved there but no FedExes anymore huh no FedEx anymore. No FedEx, anymore. exactly right. <laughs> so I think that what the difference is, is that clients, we made sure to build everything duplicity. That's why I spent a lot of money. And I was losing, not losing, but I invested almost every dollar back in profits. Because even though clients weren't into certain technologies, we built an amazing app. We had the greatest app that could tell you information on, on rates and terms, different things, calculate it, do things. So we just found that we offered to clients that wanted access to information we want offer to clients that want to track their deal they could track the deal where it's up to and, and, uh, sorry sorry for interacting i love your app Thank i you. mean when when i saw it four years ago i was like wow right. <laughs> not, many, not many people in the industry have it right so so this is where we spent money early but now as the as clients are expecting the ability to see where the deal's up to i already had that built and and because my brokers are working off the same platform and the same system, no matter who's working the deal, they could go on and see and, and track the stages of the transaction. So, and these are things obviously you have to keep making it get better in different parts of it, but that's what's changing. Slowly but surely, banks are telling me that if you would send us a deal, could you, could you send it in a way that we could also upload into our, with an API into our system? So slowly banks are having internal systems that they want us to send and be able to give it in two formats, the old fashioned way, Excel, and whatever the new fashion way is. And that's really what we're starting to see is building out now. And as firms like yourself will start streamlining different parts of the banks, then it makes it easier because we could build out, instead of building out from our end of it, a way to send out deals quickly to the 30 banks that make sense. If you're, if you're, if eight of them are your clients, I build eight, eight to connect to your system and the other 22, one off at a time. But slowly but surely, these things are streamlining because What's forcing this to happen is, is that at the end of the movie, every bank wants the ability to be able to sell the loans to a different bank. And it's becoming a standardized way for that side of the world, the securitization side of the world. And once that has to fit a box, it's a matter of time until each bank builds out the banks. Also, the average eight, you know, bankers over the last 10 years, they started taking, you know, over the last few years started, you know, um, retiring. And the next generation coming in, they were born with technology. COVID sped up the process. We got to move technology advanced. So they said a board meeting, do you really need this? There's not a single board meeting that doesn't say, yes, we got to move this technology. So I'm sure when you go out to a bank to sell your product, it's a lot easier for you to get adaption on your product today compared to where it was a year ago. It's never going to be easy, you know, but because when it gets that easy, a lot, of, a lot of new competitors coming in. But if you compare it on the metric to a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, and today, it's the easiest time you're having because you don't have to convince them they need technology. Your choice now is you or someone else. In the past, I don't even need this. I think that's what changed. They want to adjust and take that technology. You know what? You're absolutely right. We are surprised ourselves uh, how much lenders are ready uh, to get on board with new technology. Uh, it's, 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 it's interesting because everyone is saying, you know, it's a long sales cycle to sell to uh, banks, to lenders, but it seems like last year really made them think that, okay, we need to digitize. Uh, so with that, uh, let me ask you, what kind of trends do you see uh, in 
commercial real estate finance, commercial real estate lending, uh, that is that is trends that are going to change the industry in the next five or 10 years? So I, I think that the trends are going to be is that the financial, there's no new banks really opening. On a net basis, I think banks are merging versus opening. And if everyone is securitizing and all those these different parts of the process are setting themselves up to be able to securitize, I think we're running into a situation where more and more deals are going to have to fit into a certain type of box. They're going to look to create those boxes. And you can have, you know, now there's like many different variations of getting loans done. I think as time is going to progress, there's going to be two schools of thought. There's going to be the cookie cutter. And for every type of property, it have its own cookie cutter. And then there's going to be like the specialty. But the specialty is going to be smaller and smaller as it goes through. So even look at SFRs. We're doing a tremendous amount of SFRs, tremendous amount of, of, of mobile home parks, tremendous amount, and a great niche there. In that space, there are people becoming experts and like figuring out a cookie cutter process to it. And every year is getting a cookie cutter process because whichever shop is doing business wants to do volume. In order to do volume, they have to get a cookie cutter. So I think that the idea of being able to negotiate each deal separately, that's becoming, it's going to become less and less as time goes on. And especially as there's less banks, less competition to force someone to go out of their comfort zone. So that's where I think that some more of these, it's not just more of these technologies. When I meet people, you know, yes, people, why do they use a broker? Right? So there's a whole bunch of items on the list. Uh, some people use because, you know, they'll get the better rate. Some people because they'll hold their hand through the process. They know where to go. They know who to talk to. If there's a problem, you know, everyone has different items on the list. As more banks merge, they're in streamline, some of those needs change. And as those different needs change, then because of it, different values how a broker could be compensated and what they'd be compensated for. So yes, I see a, a trend of more merging. I see a trend of a banks trying to figure out how to, how to tweak their process to streamline it, quicker turnaround time using the technology, but fitting more into a box. I think we're moving more and more into a box where a bank says, okay, I'm not interested. So we're a total divide. There's the boxes and there's the custom. But I think they're going to compete. The boxes are going to slowly widen a little bit, rubber band themselves a little bit, so they could take more of a market share and just knock it out of the park and leave less to the other side, which will, again, if, if there's only a certain type that's left, again, there's not going to be that many options. You might have 20 lenders, but the base is doing the same thing. And I think that's what's going to, that's what I think is going to happen over time. But this is something I could totally be wrong for. And I can be wrong in any of the prediction I'm making, but in the way I'm setting up my business, I set up my business both on this point, assuming I'm right and assuming I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, an amazing situation because I have the greatest technology to find the right lender. And if I'm right, I'm no worse than anyone else. I'm still a little bit, ahead, hopefully, ahead of the curve in that respect from there. That's where we're at. You know, when you say about boxing commercial real estate deals, everyone will come back to you and say, but they are so different, right? No, Everything a, is so different. It's, like, it's not true. Look at look at CMBS. CMBS boxed it. At the end of the day, CMBS and Fannie Mae boxed it. That if it fits this box, they'll do it. It's a broad box. Now, they're still underwriting. You know, when I talk about boxing it, is that they box it in that you, they, they, today a deal is based on an NOI, a cap rate, debt service coverage ratio. That's a box. There's no box how to get there. I mean, there's a, a framework and everything is a story. And there's the underwriting department that's a sign of the underwriting. But when it comes to the actual lending product, it boils down, get in, figure out debt service, NOI, debt service, LTV, and I'll give you a rate and term and you're done. How to get there is not a box. So I think that's what people are mixing up the two. That's the underwriting part of it. But still, to a certain extent, the banks have a starting point. The starting point is I underwrite it this way. You have a reason I should tweak? No problem. Go to my underwriting department. But when the underwriting department signs off, they're signing off to do a final metric number that sums it up. So the last question about you know industry and technology and innovation. Um, there is this popular belief that larger clients, they are not ready for technology. They still want to, you know, basically talk on the phone. And, uh, but it's always, it's always bothers me this kind of, you know, because those, those people, they are buying from Amazon. They're, you know, using PayPal, Kayak, like all those things. Why, why is that, you know, industry thinks of them as, you know, <laughs> people in a box that don't, don't want to to don't want convenience i don't know <laughs> so I, I i happen to think that this is what the lines he's saying is being blurred it's not true they as i was saying in the beginning of this uh, in the beginning we're in a half human half machine 
the broker, the people will never be replaced. They'll be marginalized. They'll be played differently. They can handle more transactions. So of course he wants to talk to the client. He wants to talk to the seller. He wants to talk to the buyer. He is the seller. He is the buyer. He wants to go out to eat with them. That's never going to change. Yep. The difference is, how did he set up his meeting? Did he set up his meeting old school? Put out a note. And, okay, when? Oh, let me cross it out. I'll, I'll reschedule it. Or did he use his digital calendar? Use Calendarly, where he actually went in and the person picked the two calendars together to go get it work. Did he have a quick Zoom call to set up a pre-meeting before they went forward? So they're all using technology on the peripheral. Are they closing the deal with technology? No. But instead of having to spend 10 hours, you know, bridging 10 points with human intervention, they only had to bridge nine, eight, seven, six. The human is going to come and do the close. But how many steps before the close will the human have to come in? In the beginning of time, the human went up to the first phone call till the end. Now the human jumps. There's a few steps. Technology jumps over. Overseas, goes back, goes forward. And then the end comes in at the end. I think that's what's changing. So they do adapt. The biggest places are adapting even more because they're starting to really, it's data analytics. The data analytics are showing them, how do I get to my 16? Why do they realize to put money into banking? Because when I was very simple, I said, what percent of my deals am I actually tying up? But I realized that certain brokers in my office were tying up when I was at 16 and some were at eight and some were at 25, averaging 16. I spent time with the 25. What was their competitive advantage? They had better knowledge of banks. So what happens if I hired someone for everyone else that had better knowledge of banks? So I made a mathematical calculation. make the investment. And if I increase my conversion by 1%, I'll be great. Two, I made a major investment in different things within banking and relationships to take us to that next level. My goal is to get to 20. The same investment got me to 27. It's crazy. So that was with God's help. Go there. I did what I thought to do. Went out. And again, now we step back now. We realize, you know something? The best people are at 33%. New people, the worst people just starting, they're starting at 16%. Now I want to focus that next level up. I know it's possible. And I keep doing So the human side is always going to be there. At the end of the day, we're always going to be there. It's never, ever, ever going to change. The question is, can one human, how many deals could they close when they utilize technology? How, how little the transaction has to be actually in person? Take Zoom. Everything can be done on Zoom. It's not as good as in person. It's not as bad as phone. In my office, we don't have phone call conference calls anymore, right? When's the last time I had a conference call? It's all Zoom as mm -hmm. the minimum. And then you even step up. And I have a hybrids. I go into a meeting now. One person can come. We don't wait three weeks to get the meeting. As long as 75% of the attendees could show up in person, we do it. And the rest come up on Zoom. So that is using technology and people mixed together at the same time. So they are using technology. They mean, they, when they think, are they, are they, are they going to be replaced with technology? Never. And they're right. But they're using the technology around them to move them forward. Got it. That, that's a great comment. We are almost at the end of the podcast. And, you know, uh, you know us, we know you, and you've been watching Real Atom for some time. So tell me what you like and you don't like about Real Atom. Like I said, for my... And don't say founders. As, a, <laughs> as a, the people saw the business we always like, right? People's not changing. I think that from, I can only answer from my end of it, is that again, if you're successful, from my end, from where I'm sitting today, it's not as big of a deal as it was a couple of years ago. Because a couple of years ago, a big part of my success was the knowledge of to differentiate one lender from the next. That's why it was one big value add. That value add has changed a lot. It's been more the other sides of what a broker does. But if you're really successful, and I, go, I look at every business, I say, what happens if 100% adaption you get? If every single lender is using the same exact platform, then it makes it much easier for a piece of technology to be set up to marginalize me, where a client, before they call the brokerage community, will go onto that one platform and send it out to the banks. They know everything what those banks are doing. So yes, will they use a broker? But they'll start with the starting point. Now they come to IRA, I think I get 3.5%. I go to the market, I say, by the way, not only can't get three and a half, the best I get is three and three quarters. And they, they, he does his own research and I was right. And he goes forward to three and three quarters. But soon about says an IRA, I went on to real item or a system that links to real item. And I'm told I could get this rate. If you can beat it, I'll use you. Now, and that's also my point to ask people. Why does every client start the conversation? If you could beat it, I'll use you. If they need a broker, why are they saying beat it? Even if you can't beat it, I'll pay less, but I'll still run it, right? So subconsciously, it's because they think a broker is providing them value. So the biggest threat to the brokerage community and to myself also will make a hit is if you're fully adaptable to every single bank, whether it's you or someone similar to you, or even if there's two or three real atoms that, that control all the banks. 
but then it streamlined the process. The more the process around the broker gets streamlined, the less value add that broker go ahead and bring to the table. If there's one bank in the world, can I do? Can I can I provide value? If there's two a little bit, I can create competition. If there's a hundred, two hundred, a thousand, and they're using different platforms. I know how to communicate. I speak their language. Give me your deal, Mr. Client. I know how to speak to all the bank's language. But if there's one language called Real, Ad Real Adam, and that's where the difference becomes from there. Got it. Uh, the very last uh, uh, question, what are you reading? Or do you even have time to read? I, the only thing I'm reading is not enough in the day. I study the Talmud every day. So not enough. That's what uh, we use it to, to study the Talmud. And that's it. And uh, once in a while, I, someone sends me a good article. They, they flag me a part of a book I should read. But uh, no, I, uh, I, I'm sticking to the Talmud. <laughs> Got it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming to uh, the much. podcast and uh, sharing your amazing, amazing journey and insights. I, I, I appreciate it. And uh, listen, continue best success for you. I, I, I believe someone else's success is not going to be my, my, my failure. So there's room. I'll adapt to a different part. If God decides I'm supposed to make it, the, the real estate world is big enough to find the, 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 the few dollars that each of us want to make within that uh, scope. So thank you very much as well. I appreciate it. Uh, Ira, thank you. And uh, this was Yule Yani with Real Atom and our podcast about innovations uh, in commercial real estate finance industry. Thank you, everyone.